Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to Caring Medical Florida here in Fort Myers, Florida. So glad you could join us today. I'm sorry if you have a cervical disc herniation. Boy, I had one of those in the 1990s. I remember uh, when I had it, I also had the flu. And one thing that increases spinal pressure is coughing. So every time I would cough, I mean the pain uh, in my neck and shooting down my arms, it probably was the worst I've ever had. And that went on for about six weeks. And it was, you know, and then believe it or not, I did work during that time. And man, that was some of the roughest uh, times I had to work. But I'm happy to report, even about a year ago, I had an EMG and it said, all my nerves are completely normal. So and those of you who know me well know that I did do five Ironmans after my cervical uh, disc herniation. So I definitely got back to doing everything I want to do. Uh, I did a lot of swimming, you know, to do the Ironman. It's a 2.4 mile swim in the ocean and uh, did some 5K swims. I did, I completed four. 3.1 mile swims in open water. So you can imagine like all the neck twisting and everything. So I can definitely tell you that prolotherapy works really, really well for cervical uh, disc herniations. And just to remind everybody that uh, in between the vertebrae are these things called discs. The discs are surrounded by ligament tissue. So when a disc herniates, it herniates through ligament tissue. When it herniates, the disc material can pinch on the nerve. That's the bad kind of inflammation. That's why sometimes you have to take steroids or get steroid shots just to reduce the amount of nerve inflammation to protect the nerve. And these are some of the terms that you'll see when you go on Google and you search disc herniations, also called prolapse. Sometimes the disc material extrudes from the disc and now it's in the spinal canal and occasionally that has to get removed by a surgeon. You know, again, different illustrations that even a bulging disc or protruding disc can pinch on a nerve and once it prolapses or herniates through the annulus fibrosis, that can really, really irritate a nerve and that kind of pain can be 24 seven. So if you have a leg pain that's 24 seven or an arm pain 24 seven, it's likely that you have a disc herniation. And this is just what some of the disc herniations look like. You could see right here where it can really, really encroach on the spinal cord and also the nerve roots. So sometimes disc herniations in the thoracic area or the neck can actually give you leg symptoms because nerve impulses from the legs to get to the brain, it goes up through the neck. So this is, slide is just to show that the vertebrae are held together by elastic structures called ligaments. When those ligaments get too stretched out, there's excessive movements of the bone and the excessive movement of the bone in the neck is called cervical instability. This just shows that disc herniations increase with age and the reason they increase with age is that the discs and the ligaments are more degenerated typically as we get older and by degenerated I mean weaker, injured, less strong. So ligaments that are weakened, they're more likely to have a disc herniation go through them. And as the disc gets degenerated, it's less strong. So the jelly material inside it called the nucleus pulposus is more likely to herniate through. And this is a complicated slide. I have the reference there, but basically it shows that the more that there's a breakdown of the cervical curve, the more likely it is that your discs are degenerated, and the more that your discs are degenerated, the more likely they're gonna herniate. When a disc herniates in the neck and pinches on a nerve, you get like severe, severe, unremitting arm pain. And when I had my disc herniation, it felt like this part of my arm and hand was on fire and it was 24 seven. And there was very few things that helped it get better. 
Spinal instability or cervical instability can cause anything from herniated discs, anterolosis, where one vertebrae slips on top of another, radiculopathy or a pinched nerve. It can cause, as you know from other videos, it can cause intracranial hypertension, uh, cervical degenerative disc disease. It can cause cervical spondylosis or osteoarthritis or bone spur formation in the neck. It can cause uh, vagus nerve issues, uh, compression of the jugular vein. And anybody who wants more information on how a breakdown of the cervical curve or cervical instability causes vagus nerve problems, watch some of the videos that I made on the vagus nerve. This just shows that with a cervical instability, you get bridging osteophytes. Think about this. There has to be a reason why muscles tense and there has to be a reason why the body overgrows bone. So the reason that you get muscle tension or you get an overgrowth of bone is the body's trying to limit the motion. So why would the body try to limit neck motion? Well, you have too much neck motion from ligament injury. Ligaments connect the bones. When the ligaments become injured, torn, degenerated, they can't stop excessive movements of the vertebrae. So the vertebrae, like when you're looking down, you know, so when you're looking down, it goes excessively, right? So when the ligament gets stretched, it causes the muscles to tighten because otherwise if the bones move too much, it would injure the spinal cord or injure the vagus nerve or injure the spinal nerve roots. So where there's excessive force, the bones will overgrow and the overgrowth of bone is called osteoarthritis and also called bone spurs and the bone spurs limit motion. So the long-term sequelae of instability of the spine is osteoarthritis. This just shows there's different ways that a doctor measures whether or not a person has a normal cervical curve. If you lose your cervical curve, that's going to put extra pressure on the ligaments, on the disc, and they're much more prone to getting injured. And again, let's remember that the lumbar curve and the cervical curve both go back. That's called lordosis. So if you have poor posture, poor posture, looking down at a cell phone or looking in front of a computer. So if you have chronic low back pain and chronic neck pain, I'm just telling you, you got to get your computer screen up. You got to get your posture better uh, with work, with using the computer and try not to look down so much at the cell phone. This just shows that when we lay down, because a lot of people say their low back pain or their neck pain feels much better when they lay down because there's so much less force on the ligaments and on the disc. When you lay down, that's when fluid from your bone marrow goes into the disc. This is going to be an interesting fact. I don't know if you guys know this or not. If we measured Izzy, who's behind the camera here, if we measured her height, at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, she can lose up to three-fourths of an inch in height. Right? Isn't that interesting? It's because as you, as you are upright, you lose a little bit of fluid in the disc. So basically, you do have to lay down at night for lots of reasons, because the jugular veins open, which brain drains your brain, but also fluid goes back into the discs and the discs try to regenerate during the night. And this just shows that it's the capsular ligaments that basically get injured and eventually, if the capsular ligaments which surround the facet joint, those are the bony attachments of adjacent vertebrae, when these get injured, the vertebrae move too much and that extra movement causes pressure on the discs and the discs become degenerated and eventually herniate. This just shows that it only takes a few extra millimeters of elongation of the ligaments for the ligaments to completely tear. So we're just talking about millimeters, not inches, millimeters. All you have to do is have a ligament 
be stretched by a millimeter or two and that ligament can get so weakened that it can actually tear. And this explains the disc deterioration process. It's akin to like a loose screw on a hinge. So imagine you're opening your door in your kitchen, one of your kitchen cabinet doors, and you feel a jingling and there's one screw loose. Well, you know if you don't tighten that screw, the next screw is going to get loose. That hinge gets loose, then the next hinge gets loose. Same thing occurs in the lower back, thoracic and cervical areas that once you have a ligament injury and there's two vertebrae that are moving excessively, the next segment above is going to get loose. So the cervical instability process or cervical ligament injury process is a progressive disorder. That's why when you get on medications as a treatment, at some point the medications aren't going to help anymore, not because you have a tolerance to the medication, it's your disease process has progressed. So that's kind of something people don't often know about. So if you have a you've been on a medication for a while for any condition and now it's not working, it's likely that your disease process has progressed. So always try to get it at the root cause of the disease process and with cervical disc herniations or disc degeneration, the cause is almost always ligamentous. And then this just explains how facet joint problems ultimately lead to intervertebral disc problems. You can get disc tears and where there's a tear, the disc can herniate through and the disc herniation often pinches or inflames a nerve and that's why you get the severe pain down the arm. And this just explains again that it's a progressive process. The most common disc that gets involved is C4-5 and that's because when you flex your neck the fulcrum of flexion is at the C4-5 level. So that's the level that often gets the most amount of force and it's common to get disc herniations. Normal disc, some degenerated, a lot of degenerations. You can imagine if you got hit in the face with a basketball and your disc was like that, that one is much more likely to herniate than this one. One of the reasons to maintain your cervical curve is the forces on the disc are much less and the disc is much more likely to be like this. If you have lost your cervical curve or the cervical curve is reversed, it's much more likely your disc looks like that and that is a real weak disc and it's really easy for that to herniate. This just shows uh, disc replacements. That's what disc replacements look like. A lot of people don't know this also. Remember we said the the force, the tensile strength of a ligament is X amount. Well, imagine what is the strength of uh, the disc replacement. See where it says cobalt, chromium, zirconium, 820, 1000, and osteoarthritic cartilage 2, ACL 35, 150. The main point of this is one of the reasons to try not to get a fusion or a disc replacement is that the replacement parts, the metal parts are 10 times, 15 times stronger than the ligaments. They're 200 times, 500 times the strength of the cartilage in the facet joints. So it means that as a person goes along, and they have a disc replacement, all those forces are borne by the surrounding tissue because the disc replacement is so strong. You know, the, the heavy metal is so strong. So as you're going along in life, in, in your neck is bang, bang, bang. It's like a metal pieces. So what happens is the forces go around the surrounding area. Guess what we find at Caring Medical when I x-ray, when I do motion x-rays on the people, they have all kinds of instability around the disc replacements. I'm not saying I would never get a disc replacement. I didn't say that. I'm just saying that, you know, if you have a lot of pain, try conservative 
treatments. Try to get your computer system up. Do exercises to get your neck curve as good as it could. Do uh, postures that cause the neck muscles to contract. And if needed, do some prolotherapy to ligaments. And often you won't need a disc replacement. So let's show, I'm just gonna show you, this is a patient I saw this week. See the disc replacement. You'll see all the motion here. There, there's so much motion here. So there's instability in other places, but there's a massive amount of instability where the disc replacement was. And the person said, they felt much worse after the disc replacement. It didn't do anything. So I have no doubt prior to getting the disc replacement, the person did have disc degeneration there, but it wasn't causing their symptoms. That's one. Two is when they put in the disc replacement, they got to go through a bunch of ligaments. And let's just say for argument's sake that ligament injury was the cause of the disc getting degenerated then you know the treatment should be geared toward the ligaments and the treatment for that is prolotherapy. Prolotherapy injections to the injured ligaments causes them to thicken and tighten and helps resolve cervical instability. There's lots of different studies that show that conservative care for the neck, the results at one year or two years are just as good as surgery. And then if you do get surgery, especially a fusion, there's a high risk above that level or below that level of getting degenerative disc disease. And lots of times it can actually get to be symptomatic. So one of the reasons you know, not to get a fusion in the neck is that then when a person moves, the forces are gonna go above the fusion and below the fusion and that can lead to instability in the future. This is a really good study. I put the graph here. It just shows that the people had cervical radiculopathy, meaning they had a pinched nerve from a disc herniation, and they had three groups. One group didn't do anything. One group did a, just wore a cervical collar, and another group did physical therapy. And you could sort of see that at six months, I mean, the results are basically the same. Like, they all got better. So just know the body knows how to take care of itself, even with a pinched nerve or a disc herniation. By six months, most people are much, much better. Now, obviously, since I believe that the majority of the causes of disc herniations is cervical instability, and you would know that you have cervical instability because you got clicking, popping, grinding in the neck, like you've ignored it for years, then you got a disc herniation. Well, you know you had cervical instability before the disc herniation. Or if somebody had a lot of tension in the neck, you know, they got like a baseline tension in their neck. Well, the tension in the neck is the muscles contracting. Why? Because you've got excessive movement of your neck because of ligament injury and the body's recruiting the muscles to stabilize the neck. And this is basically, this is how the neck disc is uh, supposed to be. See how it's oblong there and there's no cerebral spinal fluid there. And you can see there where there's disc herniations and it's encroaching on the spinal cord. Now when there's disc herniation that's basically strangulating the spinal cord, that's where a person would need decompressive surgery and probably a fusion. So there definitely are cases where the disc herniation is so severe, there's too much of a risk of long-term nerve damage or spinal cord damage that you need to get a decompressive surgery. This is just data, in-house data, from our office on 40 patients. This was basically from the 90s. Uh, it just showed that the majority of the people with herniated discs in the lumbar region or the cervical region, that when they got a series of prolotherapy treatments, the pain level diminished drastically. There were a few people that ended up needing a surgery. So I'm not anti-surgery. I just feel that unless it's an emergency, you should try some prolotherapy uh, before you sign up for surgery. So why don't we watch uh, uh, this actually a friend of mine that I treated who volunteered to have me, uh, have me uh, film her getting prolotherapy. So, you know, so we tried to do side by side where you could see the needle going in. So you'll see that uh, the prolotherapy needle goes to, goes onto the bone. Uh, the, the, 
this was filmed with an x-ray equipment just to basically, uh, I was doing a talk for some doctors over in Asia and I wanted to just show where the needle, the needle was going so we x-rayed this. Most people, the prolotherapy in the neck and the lower back, it's done under ultrasound guidance so you see see the prolotherapy done. We go each segment. So typically by the time somebody sees a prolotherapist, there's many levels of instability. So many levels of the neck need to be done. And this particular person didn't have any uh, sedation. So they, they're just getting the treatment done. And you can see that the treatment doesn't take a long time. I did one side, now we're doing the other side. You could see that was right on the facet joint there. So typically there's four injections per vertebral segment. Prolotherapy works very well. Uh, depending on the severity of the case, somebody can get anywhere from three visits of prolotherapy to some of the severe cases I see, you know, need up to 12 visits but those would be like patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome who have just an enormous amount of ligament laxity. Most herniated discs need anywhere from three to six visits of prolotherapy. The results typically have a long-lasting effect, so that would be another reason to get prolotherapy.